Hello and welcome to this segment of the DuPage Birding Club. I'm talking about all things birds and bird related. This is Jeff Chapman. I am the compiler of the Fermilab uh, Christmas Bird Count. And I'll be talking to you about not only our count, but also a little bit of history uh, as far as the uh, Christmas Bird Count is concerned. Uh, the Christmas bird count is officially called the Fermilab Batavia count, uh, and you can find information on the count on the, the CBC Audubon website. We're centered around, obviously, Fermilab, it goes as far north as Pratt's Wayne Woods, out west into Kane County, and out east into Wheaton and south into Aurora. But first, let's take a step back and uh, try to understand how the Christmas count got started. Uh, back in the late 1800s, they used to have what they termed a side hunt where people would go out and basically shoot every wild animal they could find, whether it be bird or mammal, it didn't matter. And fortunately, uh, naturalist uh, Frank Chapman from the American Museum of Natural History thought, why don't we take this opportunity to do something that's actually good for wildlife instead of detrimental. So he established the first uh, Christmas bird census in 1900. He picked up 27 birders from around the country and in 25 counts that first year in 1900, they managed to get 90 species. Um, and you got to think that's pretty impressive considering they didn't have uh, modern optics and ca digital cameras and the like. And most of the counts clearly, as you can see, had one burger in the whole uh, whole area. One of the first counts actually within those 25 was held in Glen Ellen. Uh, that circle does not exist anymore, but there is some overlap between the Fermilab uh, count and the adjacent Arboretum count, which is also held partially in DuPage County, uh, although it's done by a different organization. Uh, an interesting note is that that count, he, the counter had eight greater prairie chickens in DuPage County. So uh, that's kind of an interesting aspect. We haven't seen prairie chickens probably for a hundred years. So uh, the evolution from there, uh, basically it uh, kept gaining momentum until uh, today we have over 2,200 circles in 20 different countries. Um, and as you can see from the numbers, six, 60,000 plus participants each year report more than 2,400 bird species and over 64 million individual birds. Um, just to give you an idea uh, of how these counts are run, every circle is 15 miles in diameter. Uh, and you count every bird you see in here within that circle within a 24-hour period. Now these counts are held between December 14th and January 5th. And I think that's a pretty helpful window for those of us who like to count in more than one area, get a chance to go to different locations and uh, count, different, count birds in different areas. Uh, you can count anything you see or hear um, as long as you're sure of the identification. And you can do that on foot and, or by car, as most of them are done. But there are people who do counts uh, in specific areas of the, of the world uh, where by snowmobile or even dog sled or boats or uh, even watching feeders. Uh, that's become, I think, in 2020, probably a good idea to do. To, if you want to avoid other people to count the birds uh, that are at your feeder, as long as you are within uh, the counting circle uh, at the day of the count. Um, and all this data is submitted to the uh, Audubon where they track all the CBC data. And just to give you an idea of what, uh, what they have on their website, and I'm going to flip over screens here, and you'll see our. Let's see. Okay. The, you'll see our circle 
uh, where we where Fermilab is in the center of the screen and it's marked by the actual circle. Now, if I start to pan out a little bit, you'll see that there are a lot of circles in our area. And if you click on these circles, you actually get some details. So if you want to join other circles, you'll see how many there actually are. There's actually a ton of them. And then if we keep panning out to the, to the whole hemisphere, they actually extend down to Tierra del Fuego, down on a research vessel um, off the tip of South America. And this information again is uh, on this website and that's an excellent website uh, to get a lot of data and to uh, kind of spend a lot of time, go down the rabbit hole of a lot of information. So the history of our count, um, and it's, it's technically the Fermilab Batavia Christmas count. We, shorten it to Fermi CBC. Um, it started in 1976. Uh, 44 counters uh, tallied 60 species that year. And some of the interesting aspects of the count in 1976 is that there were quite a few birds that would not be found in the numbers they are today. Um, and I've given a couple examples here. Ringneck pheasant counted 147 on that first count. Um, today we're lucky if we get one. Uh, it's just, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Rough-legged hawk as well, they like open areas. And so uh, that is a bird you would ex expect to see in, in a lot of open space. Um, as you can imagine the past 44 years, uh, a lot has changed as far as uh, the habitat within the circle. And certainly the, the biggest change is urbanization. I mean, we, we've been subjected to uh, suburban sprawl, uh, as have most of the large city areas. And uh, we just don't have the open spaces we once had. Um, so finding things like snow bunting and pheasant and uh, short-eared owls have become more difficult uh, to do as we lose these open spaces. Um, another aspect is land use changes. Um, a specific example that I can give is in 1982, our count was changed when Settlers Hill landfill opened up. And for birders, they know that in the winter, um, gulls are very much attracted to the landfills. And we used to get a lot of gulls uh, come through Settlers Hill. Uh, however, in 2006, it closed. And so those gulls are pretty much gone. <laughs> so we do occasionally get some gulls along the fox as far as uh, interesting gulls, but uh, the vast numbers of them are gone. Um, so that's just one way that land use has changed um, to help us and to hurt us in essence. Climate change is certainly an issue as well. And you can see there's some interesting articles on the Audubon website, um, but, but birds like uh, red-bellied woodpecker that wouldn't typically spend the winter uh, 44 years ago uh, in quite the numbers that they knew now, uh, has that has changed dramatically and, and even birds like Northern Cardinal, uh, if you go back from 50, 60 years ago, did not overwinter nearly as much as they do now. Now they're quite, quite common. Um, another aspect uh, is environmental regulations. The establishment of the EPA and the Clean Water and Clean Air Act and reducing pesticide use, uh, especially certain pesticides like DDT, have definitely uh, responded positively uh, for birds and other wildlife. Uh, the case of the bald eagle and the thinning eggshells is a, is a well-known example of uh, 
eliminating DDT from the environment and now those birds are off the endangered species list. They're not even threatened and they nest throughout Kane and uh, DuPage County as well as the whole Chicagoland area. So that, that's an ex absolute success story and um, our counts do reflect uh, the increase of some of these species. Uh, some, some quick hits from Fermi. We've had 44 counts so far. Our next one is planned for uh, later on this month. Uh, we've seen a, a total of 146 different species over those 44 years. Um, and then we've averaged 72 species per year. Now that average, that rolling average uh, over the last 10 years is, is up to 84 species. Um, but that's also a reflection of the number of participants who are actually counting so you see that over the last 10 years, we've averaged 110 participants, which makes us by and far the largest uh, Christmas bird count in Illinois and one of the largest in the Midwest. And of course, not over half of the birds we typically count, if you're talking about total numbers of birds, is our friend the Canada goose. So I'm gonna flip over and share my other screen again. So here's our circle again. We're back at our, our circle and I want to give a little bit of detail of kind of what we're looking at here. When you have a average 110 participants over, <laughs> over a count, it seems like a lot, but it, I, I'm saying it, I guess it seems like not that many people to have in a 15 mile diameter circle, but it's, it's logistically, it's, it's pretty tough. So we break those into areas. And right now our Fermi circle is broken into eight areas. Area one is the lab itself and the grounds that it contains. And there's actually a lot of wonderful habitat throughout the, throughout the lab. Area two is the Southeast portion. And it's a little bit of suburbia, but it's also We've got a few forest preserves that are quite nice. Herrick Lake, Warrenville Grove, and McDowell Grove are the big three areas there. Um, going further north, Area 3 has, again, three major areas. Blackwell Forest Preserve, which includes McKee Marsh, uh, St. James Farm, and Cantini, uh, which is good, always good for us for turkeys and red-headed woodpecker. And there's also a couple smaller, Blinken Marsh is a nice one, as well as Winfield Mounds. Uh, area four is in the northeast part of the circle, and West Branch and Timber Ridge are uh, the, the primary forest preserves, but you have the Great Western Trail, as well as uh, the Prairie Path for bike trails that provide access into a lot of areas. Area five, uh, it's a big area, but uh, Pratt's Wayne Woods is probably the most uh, important piece in this, uh, in Area 5. But you also have the DuPage Airport, which provides a lot of open country. And you have West Chicago Prairie and the uh, technology area along Fabian Parkway, which is relatively recent. 20 years ago, that didn't exist. Uh, that was all farm field and sod farms. Area six is a, is a narrow part. I call it the, uh, the calm or uh, unwild. <laughs> it's the kept part of, of uh, the Fox River in essence and all the King County Forest Preserves along the way. Um, and so you have, you have the dams that are typically associated with the Fox River in this section and that can provide good areas for gulls and diving ducks and bald eagles. Um, and then the area due south of there is area seven. Again, this is, the, this is more of the wild area of the forest or of the Fox River. There tends not to be any dams down here. Uh, it's more wooded, uh, but they also contain, contain moose heart and uh, big, big Woods Forest Preserve as well. And they do get part of Oakhurst Forest Preserve, which is a relatively new area. 
and then the big chunk uh, out on the west side of the of the count is area eight and the king county forest preserve folks cover that area you have dick young forest preserve with nelson lake marsh uh, peck farm is really good braeburn uh, marsh is another spot and then they have probably a lot of their secret areas that uh, I just don't know <laughs> know about, but there's a lot of uh, interesting locations. Uh, there's always something for everybody uh, to uh, to explore in their general vicinity. So those are the areas that Fermilab is broken down to. Here are the species that have been found in every Christmas count. So none of them are really that surprising. Uh, most counters and most areas count decent numbers of these. We've had a decline in kestrels. Um, golden eyes and black duck are two that I find that's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't get a lot in my area and area two. Um, but otherwise, these are birds that we would expect that most, most Christmas counts in our area will definitely get those. And here's kind of a, a table of, of uh, species totals per year. And you see in 2011, we actually had the highest species total we've had at 93 species, which is pretty respectable for Northern Illinois in December count. <laughs> um, Southern Illinois, they tend to get over 100 species, but up in Northern Illinois, 93 is a pretty solid number. Um, and of course, this does correlate with the participation. Um, you see, again, 2011, uh, we had 138 participants, which is kind of insane. But uh, we largely, we typically get over 100 participants every count. Um, and so you would expect species numbers to rise as participation rises. Um, you'll just get to get in every nook and cranny and find as many birds as possible. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the species uh, and uh, trending that we're seeing from some of the data we have and, how, and a little bit of how that compares with some of the other counts in the area as well as the state. Um, Red-bellied woodpecker, I, I've kind of mentioned this before, um, that's a bird that was kind of a southerly bird and you see, they only had 13 of them in 1976, and we regularly get over 200 now. Um, that is a bird that has moved up north and is now the most common woodpecker in the state, uh, to the detriment of, of red-headed woodpecker, I think. But um, so these, these numbers have definitely increased a lot, and I'm going to share another screen one more time. Um, And as this switches over, this is an Audubon website, which illustrates uh, some of the searching tools that you can use for any count they have that that has been performed and entered into their into their website. And so this is basically a, a running total of red-bellied woodpecker state state level uh, trends from 1970 to 2019. And so I I've put it just for Illinois and you could see that there's an annual positive change of 1.8 percent and you can do this for any species and see if the how things are trending up and down but otherwise I just wanted to show and kind of let you know the different types of data that you can actually get from the website which I think is very uh, very interesting and uh, um, you could spend a lot of time in the cold winter days uh, looking at this data. Uh, downy woodpecker, it's another bird that's show, shown increase over the years and it's our namesake logo. Um, and we, we've generally been increasing downy woodpeckers through the years. White-breasted nuthatch, another one um, that was sort of southerly um, we did always, you know, we've always had white-breasted nuthatches, but they've just definitely increased in this area. And this definitely is 
a bird that it's not just the Fermi count that's that's increasing. Uh, the Morton Arboretum count is usually held the day after the Fermi count, and they're seeing the exact same trends of these last three birds. So I think that's kind of interesting. There's something else going on there. Cooper's hawk, this is a little bit of a different uh, reason why it's increased. Um, you see back in the in the 70s and 80s, it, if you had a Cooper's hawk, that was, you know, the, the bird of the count. That was a rare bird. Um, I think there's a couple factors. Uh, one, it was, there was a lot more agricultural land early on in the count. And as uh, suburbanization occurred, uh, Cooper's hawks uh, realized that they could actually hunt feeders because they eat birds mostly. And so uh, they took to the feeders. And with that, their numbers increased. I think they also benefited from the environmental regulations, again, with um, banning of, of certain pesticides and such. So I think there's a multitude of factors, but certainly they don't mind being around uh, human habitation, uh, at least uh, for feeding strategies. I know I've, my feeders have donated many a morning dove uh, to these cooper sites. Uh, bald eagle. Uh, I had mentioned this before, the DDT with the thinning eggshells. Uh, once that was eliminated, that was a, a major factor. And then there was also a lot of uh, environmental management going on. But as you can see, once we hit somewhere in the early 2000s, the numbers really started going up. And most of these birds are found along the Fox River um, corridor. So, uh, you know, the, we've, we've actually got into the 40s for a couple years. And I think, you know, certainly as birds fly up and down the river, they have a tendency to get counted more than once, I think. But realistically, I mean, 20 birds is probably about what they can, uh, what this stretch of river can sustain. Um, it's, you know, it's just a, it's kind of, this Fox River is kind of small and the dams aren't as substantial as they are along the Mississippi or the Illinois River. So steadily increasing bald eagles and they're stable and actually nesting in quite a lot of locations in the Chicagoland area. So that's really good to see. So let's talk about some of the birds that are not doing so well. American crow, um, if you don't live in the west suburbs of Kane, DuPage, McHenry, you might find this kind of odd, but West Nile virus hit us in the early 2000s and we had some major crow roosts that were completely decimated and they just didn't return. Our numbers are consistently low and I know even during the warmer months we do not get a lot of crows. I saw 12 crows early this year in the summer at, in one spot, and that was the most I had seen in DuPage since probably 2002 or 2001. Um, they really took a hit in our area from West Nile virus. Uh, chickadees took a hit, but they rebounded almost instantly. Uh, Blue Jays were another one took a hit, but they re rebounded. So something's going on with the American crow. They just didn't rebound like the other birds did. So it's still a treat to see them, believe it or not. Uh, Red-headed woodpecker. Uh, this one is a bird who's definitely decreased in our area. A lot of North Central uh, United States have seen dramatic decreases of red-headed woodpecker. Um, I think there's a multitude of reasons in our area. Um, I think one, we don't have the open farmland with the wood telephone poles that they like to nest in. Our bottomland forests are few and far between where they nest as well. Um, I think they do move out of the area in the winter generally. Um, I, they're also definitely being out competed for nest holes. Uh, definitely from uh, European starling, but also from red-bellied woodpecker as well. But it's a bird that's really difficult to get in our area. And Cantini has had a couple resident birds uh, off and on. Um, and they're the ones who always help us uh, make sure we tally one. But we did have a stretch in the early 2000s or 
where we didn't get any for a while, but they're clinging on at this point, but definitely far decreased from previous. Here's another one, ring-necked pheasant. And this one's down um, pretty much because of urbanization. Um, they need fields with an edge habitat and there's just very few farm fields anymore. I mean, you look at 1978, there was 209 pheasants counted. And you look at the last five, 10 years, and you know we've hit double digits twice, and those are probably a result of canned hunting <laughs> locations. So um, that's a bird that's probably, I mean, it's introduced anyway, so it's not uh, a tragic ecological loss, but um, they are pretty birds. And uh, it's just one that's decreased a lot, even in Illinois. Uh, itself. They're still fairly abundant out in the Great Plains is my understanding. Um, over the years we've lost some species, we've gained some species. Uh, Cackling goose was formally split from Canada goose in 2004. And you see from the picture they look, it's obvious how different they look, but um, of course the world's not like that and you don't always see them sitting next to each, uh, each other like that. And um, we've always recorded them every year, but I think uh, overall people have got better at determining what a cackling goose is because some of the migratory Canada geese can be somewhat smaller. They're not as small as cacklers, but um, we have had them in every count and, and we haven't had as many Let's put it this way, in 2004, I think we had our record high count and it's been going down ever since. And I don't think that's um, because statistically they're in decline. I think it's because frankly, birders are better at determining uh, cacklers from regular candidates. Uh, house finch, a lot of us don't think of as house finch as, a, as an introduced bird and it kind of sort of isn't. Um, it's native to the Western US uh, was introduced in the 1800s into New York and worked its way slowly east until it reached Illinois in 1971, but it was first recorded on our count in 1983 and is a pretty much common bird at most bird feeders and we count them every year. So um, even though it's not intro introduced, it's, uh, it is technically not a native bird. Um, one bird we lost a couple years ago is Thayer's gull. Uh, they lumped it with Iceland gull, which most birders and uh, ornithologists agree that that was probably the right move. Um, it was kind of a flawed study that separated them in the first place. And uh, although we lost that for our Fermilab list and we lost it for our personal life list, et cetera, um, it was probably the right move. So it went away in 2017. And just a couple fun birds. I mean, we sometimes get exotics uh, notice when you have that many people out in one day. Uh, we did get a yellow grosbeak at Fermilab in 1999. Um, and we got a budgie uh, a couple years ago. These birds do not go on our list uh, for official birds. They're just kind of um, kind of fun uh, release cage birds. Unfortunately, they probably didn't make it through the winter. Uh, birds that are seen have been seen only once uh, on the count. Uh, I basically put the laundry list out there with the year that they were seen. Um, a couple of these I find uh, not su surprising is the wrong word, but it's peculiar. Uh, Red-breasted merganser is one that counts all around us. They see them. They, they're they're large numbers on the lakefront in the winter. So I would think we would have seen more than just one. <laughs> over 44 years, but that's not the case. Um, Virginia rail is another one. Uh, I just think that they're around, um, you know, one, one or two. We just haven't been lucky enough to get one on the count. Uh, Eurasian color dove is another one that's pretty much ubiquitous throughout Illinois. Um, and they, it's like they advanced to Will County and Western Kane County, but then sort of stopped. And so we haven't got one for almost 10 years. So I, I expect that one to be back 
um, and not be on the, the one, one time viewer. Snowy Owl is another one I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but some of these warblers and stuff that, you know, they're good luck at trying to find those again. Uh, this is a list of birds that I think it's been a while for our count. I think the last one was 2014. Um, Long-tailed duck we've had a couple times as well. black crowned night heron we've had six times, but not for a while. Um, they do, they are found in other counts, um, particularly in the Chicago area. Snowy owl is one I can't believe we haven't had in over 35 years. Um, that's a bird that there's been some big eruptions lately in the last few years. Uh, I would think we would just invariably get one, but um, so far that's not the case. Uh, evening grosbeak, we haven't had one in over 30 years. This is a bird I definitely expect to get on the count this year. Uh, they're around. Um, a lot of times people see them if they're not at feeders, they're just flying in a loose flock low. And uh, with enough, with a hundred counters out there, hopefully we were able to get that. Um, pine grosbeak, yeah, it's been a long time. We've only had them once. Uh, I would love to get that, but there has not been a pine grosbeak uh, sighting yet in Illinois. So things would have to change in the next week and a half uh, for that to be possible. Lincoln Sparrow is another one. We've had it a number of times, but just haven't had it uh, since 2011. And you, you see Field Sparrow, we've had it 16 times on the count. And that's one of those we like to laugh at because the incidence of Field Sparrow sightings decreased dramatically once we required uh, documentation. And the reason that is because they, look superficially like an American tree sparrow, which is a very common bird in the winter uh, in our area. Uh, and they, they basically are, field sparrows are really common in the summer and fall, and then they're displaced basically, they move further south and the tree sparrows take their spot. And if you're not careful or don't go out birding enough or aren't tuned in enough, it's very easy just to see a bird and say, oh, that's a field, just another field sparrow. And so once we require documentation, I think we've only had one sighting or maybe two where people actually filled out the documentation. So um, that's one of those birds that's on this list. Uh, it has been a while, um, but I think people are taking better care at uh, seeing the bird as well as they can in the field. How about what else do we have? What, about every other year we get a new bird uh, for the list and I always think what what's the next one? Well this is a list of birds and many of them are have been found uh, more than one occasion on counts around us, the Arboretum count for example or, or some of the lakefront counts. Um, you know it's possible to get any one of these. Um, Bonaparte's gull is one I can't believe we haven't had once even. Uh, I know common loon and osprey have recently been found on the arboretum counts. Uh, uh, buried thrush is just one that's, we've had them in winter outside the count uh, during <laughs> on count days. So, but it's a rare bird. Uh, you just don't see too many of them. Hoary red pole, that's kind of a, a wish list type of bird. But this white winged crossbill, I really think that if we get a new bird this year, it's gonna be white winged crossbill. Uh, we've had red crossbill a couple times, and uh, I just think we're due. The white winged crossbills are around. Um, it's just a matter of running into a few of them. And I'm hopeful that somebody will find, uh, find those guys uh, so we can add them to our account. And then I could think of what else we're missing. But uh, in, in essence, that is my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I do want to thank the DuPage Birding Club, uh, as well as Kane County Audubon, who have supported the Christmas bird count of Fermilab for many, many years, basically since its inception, and uh, all the people involved that, uh, that have been part of it over the years. Um, and I want to thank you for listening to this, and hopefully uh, you got some good information. Um, please do check out the uh, Audubon 
Christmas Bird Count website, as well as uh, the DuPage Birding Club website. Again, uh, Jeff Chapman, uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for listening to this presentation. I appreciate it.